In early 1967, 20th Century Fox hired Akira Kurosawa to co-direct Tora Tora Tora. The film would be one of the largest in the studio's history, recreating with painstaking historical accuracy events surrounding the attack on Pearl Harbor. The story would be told from both American and Japanese perspectives, with simultaneous productions taking place in each country. Kurosawa, a celebrated cinematic titan, then working at the height of his powers, was going to lens the Japanese half. It was meant to be the first of several high-profile Hollywood productions. An important director seemed on the cusp of a tremendous career expansion. It all fell apart when personal and professional misfortune dismantled Kurosawa's reputation and nearly destroyed his ability to make films. This period would culminate in an emotional spiral that led to one of cinema's greatest artists attempting to take his own life. Akira Kurosawa, for Western viewers at least, is probably the most influential Japanese director of the last century. His film career begins in 1936, when he applied for a job, essentially on a whim, at a prominent studio, Toho, then known as PCL, or Photochemical Laboratories. He was hired as an assistant director, and it was under the mentorship of the generous Kajiro Yamamoto that Kurosawa fell in love with the filmmaking process. He ascended quickly through the ranks, alongside contemporaries like Ishiro Honda, the man who would go on to create Godzilla and mastermind dozens of subsequent monster movies. Kurosawa worked obsessively to master every aspect of film production, taking on editing in addition to his assistant director duties and writing original screenplays in his spare time. In the span of only a few years, he became Yamamoto's most trusted and brilliant pupil. By 1943, he was graduating to the director's chair. His first film, Sanshiro Sugata, was a popular success, but options were limited in the war years. Government censors put heavy restrictions on the content acceptable for screenplays, so Kurosawa's early films were a bit inconsistent. His second movie, titled The Most Beautiful, is extremely well made, despite being little more than a wartime propaganda film. Sanshiro Sugata Part 2 lacked the inspiration of the first, and The Men Who Tread on the Tiger's Tail, produced in the final year of World War II, was made under such severe lack of resources that Kurosawa had to construct it around a single set, and the completed movie only ran 59 minutes. It wasn't much easier after the war ended. Japan was in ruins, and the American occupation came with its own censors, who also put many restrictions on content. Kurosawa struggled to tell stories of personal meaning. No Regrets for Our Youth and One Wonderful Sunday both showcase Kurosawa's increasing ambitions and growing talents, with One Wonderful Sunday especially being a remarkable document of post-war Japan. But these movies do lack a certain spark, that special element that makes the director's best work leap off the screen. That spark finally arrived when Kurosawa started working with Toshiro Mifune. Their first movie together, Drunken Angel, was a revelation. By then, Kurosawa was sick of listening to the censors and pushed himself to make exactly the kind of film he wanted. Drunken Angel took place in an abject slum, filled with pitiful characters just trying to survive. The superlative Takeshi Shimura, Kurosawa's other great star, plays an alcoholic doctor treating a tough, low-ranking gangster for tuberculosis, and angrily attempting to reform the young man's life through his blunt honesty. Mufune played the gangster, and he managed to steal the whole movie from the much more experienced Shimura. Here was an actor unlike any previously seen on Japanese movie screens, unmannered, without professional training, and taking his own instinctual emotions as the basis for his characters. He was fierce, volatile, yet deeply vulnerable at the same time. 
The rawness of his acting style captivated the director, and Kurosawa would build most of his next 16 films, made over a 17-year period, around Mifune, whose range seemed limitless. In 1950, they released Rashomon, an enormously innovative tale, built around a complex flashback structure designed to provocatively question the nature of subjectivity and truth. A bandit has been arrested for the murder of a samurai, and during his trial, three separate testimonies are heard, each introducing more inconsistencies and contradictions, leaving us with no conclusive resolution. The film baffled many viewers in Japan, but won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival, and earned tremendous praise internationally. Arguably, Rashomon did more to introduce Western audiences to Japanese cinema than any other single film. It made Kurosawa a worldwide celebrity, and the prestige that came with this status allowed him to become probably the most powerful filmmaker in Japan. Kurosawa directed a succession of masterpieces, epic films noted as much for their expensive and lengthy productions as they were for their artistry and vision. Kurosawa became a legendary perfectionist, pushing collaborators and even himself, sometimes to the point of total exhaustion. But his unwavering commitment to his art often inspired those around him to deliver their greatest work. Kurosawa's dark, though tenderly hopeful humanist worldview found full expression in this run of films. He constructed worlds vivid and bleak, full of unforgiving violence, and when tales did not end in tragedy, it was because of characters who dared to stand in moral opposition to that world, pushing against it by making harrowing choices of sacrifice and selflessness, earning their dignity through struggle and perseverance. This period came to a climax in 1965 with Redbeard. Kurosawa's ambition and perfectionism were pushed to their absolute limit in this film. Production lasted two long years, and the attention to detail and historical accuracy was meticulous. Kurosawa constructed a full-size town as his set. Buildings were made from the oldest available wood to suggest the town's age. Actors were asked to continuously wear and wash their costumes to give them properly aged looks. Cabinets and drawers were completely stocked with period-accurate props, even if they were never seen on camera. Not even the bedding escaped Kurosawa's attention. He had people sleeping on it for six months in advance to make everything look convincingly lived in. Redbeard ranks among the director's most demanding and rewarding films. A three-hour drama, the story, portrays a young medical student's slow spiritual growth from self-centered opportunist to dedicated humanitarian, under the stern tutelage of a wise doctor, brilliantly played by Toshiro Mifune. It's a perfect encapsulation of everything Kurosawa strove to communicate in his work. The strength of empathy, the difficulty of personal growth. By the end, we are left with the essential awareness that for our world to have any chance of improving, people must live their lives for more than themselves. Although Kurosawa's action pictures tended to be more successful overseas, in his homeland, according to Stuart Galbraith, in his incredible book, The Emperor and the Wolf, The Lives and Films of Akira Kurosawa and Toshiro Mifune, Redbeard was seen as something of a creative pinnacle. Kurosawa's crowning achievement. There was not much room left for him to ascend any higher within the Japanese industry, which was already in the first stages of a long decline. To continue making films at the scale he was accustomed, Kurosawa decided it was necessary to go into business with Hollywood.